one more session today. And if you look at your notes, we are actually going to skip session 16. Because we've, already, we've covered this. We covered this earlier this week. Um, and, and what it is, I'll summarize it in about 45 seconds. It's just a review of the gospel. Because when we evangelize, th that is our message. And nothing else. Um, we're, we are not winning. Well, th there's an expression. There's an expression. What you win people with is what you win people to. So if you win people with promises of money or fame, that's, that's what they're thinking about. If you win people with promises of, of health or prosperity, that's what you're winning them to. You want to win people with the gospel so that they are one to Jesus. So, so the point of session 16 is just make sure that, evangel that when you evangelize, the gospel is your message. I mean, that sounds so simple, but it's so true. So I, it was just a walk, walking through this, the creation, fall, redemption, consummation story. Um, but we're going to actually go straight to session 17. But if you have questions about the gospel, <laughs> please let me know. Um, we might want to get that figured out <laughs> before you go into ministry. If I say to someone who, who is not in Christ, who is not a believer, if I say to someone, Jesus is king and he is on the throne, that is really, really bad news for them. That's really bad news. Because if Jesus is king and on the throne, that means they are not king and they are not on the throne. And it means that their enemy is in charge. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. The, the gospel, the power of the gospel will only, it only connects to the heart that understands its fallen state, is, is what I'm trying to say. The gospel is only good news if it is true that we are far from God. Um, when I was a child, it raised in a mostly Christian, uh, raised in a community that was at least familiar with Christianity. Most children had at least been to church some or Sunday school. I could have conversation, conversations with unbelievers even about the Bible, and they had some knowledge. But if somebody says, what is the gospel? And I start with, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Whoa, 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 whoa. Back up, back up. So what? Who is Jesus? What is sin? Why did he need to die for them? Why does that matter for me? I, I, uh, if I'm going to proclaim the gospel to somebody, they need to understand the story of creation, fall, redemption. Um, even just the term redemption implies that we need redeeming. From what? I mean, we, so we, so we, we must talk about sin. We must talk about how we have failed to keep God's perfect law ever since our first father, Adam. We have to. I think we have to. Uh, um, Jesus being king on the throne is only good news if I'm invited to get in on it and, and, and if there's remission for sin. That, that's the only way that that's good news. If there's not um, remission for sin, Jesus being on the throne is really, really bad news because it means, it means we're accountable to a just God. So, it, so I b personally believe that when some, for someone to hear and understand the gospel, and, and, and I, I absolutely understand your, your question, the gospel is the good news of, of Jesus. Jesus' finished work for sinners. But 
but if someone's going to understand and, and appreciate that, they, they have to understand that they are a sinner. Otherwise, the question is, is so what? As, um, you all know who Ray Comfort is? He's the New Zealand evangelist. You've seen videos of him. It's the same thing every time he's on, he's on the sidewalk, you know. Uh, you think you're a pretty good person? You ever told a lie? You ever stolen anything? You know, he, and he does his whole thing. But, it, but he starts by showing people there's a perfect God with a perfect standard, and you haven't kept it. That's a problem. The gospel is that, there, that there's forgiveness of our sins and that we can have favor with God. So... So I guess what I'm, peop, people need to understand law and gospel. They need to understand both of those things. The, the, the law certainly does not save us. The law condemns us, script, scripture says. Jesus saves us. So um, anyway, I, so I believe someone, someone needs to have an understanding that I am a lawbreaker and I am guilty. With that in mind, here is where there is redemption. If we start with just saying, hey, man, there's redemption. Redemption from what? Oh, let me back up. You're guilty. <laughs> um, does that make sense? What do you think? Yeah? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I see. What, I think I understand what you're saying. In other words, you're saying pastors should always preach the gospel. And, um, uh, um, What is the expression? Who, who said it? Maybe Richard Baxter, one of the Puritans. I preach every sermon as if it were my last, as a dying man to dying men. Um, the gospel needs to, needs to be in every sermon we preach. I believe people need to be understand, people need to hear salvation through Christ everywhere we preach. And I, and I believe that the Bible is written such so that we, we can and must preach the gospel in all of Scripture. Um, the gospel is for believers and it is for unbelievers. I, I believe. In other words, I believe that as a believer, I, I need to hear the gospel over and over. Not, not in the sense that I need to be saved again and again. I, I believe I was saved at my conversion and that I'm justified before God as a result of that moment. So I need the gospel not in a way, uh, uh, not in the sense of conversion, but just as a way to sustain me. Throughout, the, throughout my life because I am constantly needing to apply the gospel to my life. So I need the gospel, but not in the same way that an unbeliever needs it. They also need the gospel, but they need the gospel in a sense of that initial, that saving moment, that transfer from darkness to light. And so what I guess I'm trying to say, all people need the gospel. Unbelievers need it to be saved, to, to come to faith, and believers need it to continue in faith, uh, to, to continue walking in the Christian life. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 No, thank you. That's a good, a good clarification. Yes. I think, let me simplify it in one sentence. Every believer, every Christian has the obligation to make the gospel known where they can. To all people. <laughs> So, and, and on Sunday, from right here, in our neighborhoods and homes and workplaces as well. Yes. If you're an unbeliever, you need the gospel because I want to see you come into the family of God. Oh, you're a believer? Let me remind you of the gospel that you already believe so that you can be more like Christ today. Yeah. Good clarification. Let's, get, let's go through session 17. The role of relationship and... Um, I, th I think this will be helpful to us. How should evangelism be done? Let, let's just list. What are some different ways you've seen evangelism done, just in general? A drive-by? Drive <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Like, uh, so, like, street evangelism? Yeah, what else? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Oh, oh, one, one to one. I'm sorry. I was thinking of the numbers. One, two, one. <laughs> one on one on one. This is how, I, how we would say it. One on one. One on one. Evangelism. Okay. Yes. I'm with you. Yeah. How else? There's a really big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friendship evangelism. People call that. Uh, crusades. T- televangelism. Televangelism, yep. Yeah. 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 Me- yeah, using media. Yeah, these are all different ways that we've heard of or... Uh, yeah, yeah, preaching. There, so there's, when, so, when someone just, my point is, when someone says the word evangelism, a lot of different things can come to mind. Ray Comfort on the sidewalk with the microphone, right? Um, there are a lot of different things that come to mind when we talk about evangelism. What is the right way? And before you answer, somebody turn to Philippians 1, verses 17 and 18. Somebody explain in their own words what Paul is saying right there. What's going on right there, and what is Paul saying? Yeah. So, the question is, what is the right way? kind of hard to answer, isn't it? Even in that situation, Paul is saying, these guys aren't, I don't like how they're doing it, they have wrong motives, but the gospel is being proclaimed, so for that reason I rejoice. I, so I, I can disagree with someone's method of evangelism, I can say, I'm not sure that's the best way to do that, but the gospel is being proclaimed, and so I'm, I'm happy about that. So I'm Personally, I am very slow to say there is a wrong way. I think that in certain situations, there can be wiser and more foolish ways, depending on on the context. I think that's certainly true. But speaking very broadly, I don't think there's, this is the one right way for evangelism and everything else is wrong. I I just don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Please. He is talking more about the motive, to be fair. Yes, I guess, I guess my point in that is that Paul is saying what is most important in ministry is that the gospel is being proclaimed. Um, so so ev- even down, and I would place motive is more important than means. And so the fact that he's saying even with their wrong motives, I'm glad the gospel is going forth. So what, what that tells me is that means is even secondary to motive. So... Um, but yes, fair point, fair point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Charles Finney, if you know that name. Um, he had a, he, ha- he believed some weird things and, uh, but was part of, a, of a, a huge revival. I can't sit here and say how many of the conversions under his preaching were genuine, I can't. But I do believe the, the gospel was proclaimed at least to a degree that it could be understood in a saving way. God uses all kinds of means, I believe, for evangelism and for saving people. I think the, go- the gospel articulated must always be present, but God does use all kinds of different means. There are people, um, I, I know a, a pastor in my town, um, he, he's a little bit older, he, was, he became a Christian by flipping through the channels, and he found Billy Graham on TV. And he ended up on his knees in front of the TV crying. And he came to genuine faith. 
um, the, 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 the little tracks with the, you know, gospel presentation that people leave in public bathrooms and things, I believe some people have probably been saved through those. The regular preaching of the word on Sunday, street evangelists, through personal relationships, all of that. So I am not, what I'm about to propose is not to say that every other kind of evangelism is bad. I just, so that I just want that to be clear. I am not saying that. Um, what I do want to propose is that while there are various means of evangelism that God can and does use, I want to encourage you all to be thinking of what, what kind, there could be various ways, but what kind of evangelism should be, should mostly characterize our church? I, I would encourage you to think through that, and if I could suggest to you, I believe that the foundation, the primary foundation of our means for evangelism is relationship. That's what I would propose to you. I'm, I'm not saying never share the gospel with a stranger. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't go evangelize on the street, by all means. You, that, that may be a wonderful and fruitful thing. What I am saying is that uh, I do believe um, that the relationships that God gives you in your life should take a tremendous amount of your focus for evangelism. I, I do believe that's true. I mentioned Abraham Kuyper earlier. Dutch theologian and prime minister, and his concept of sphere sovereignty, if you remember. Um, whoever, is, whoever God has placed, and this is, this is part of our, being, our Reformed theology, God has placed us in specific places and times on purpose. He didn't uh, shake us up in a can and just throw us on the earth and, oh, oh that's, where, that's where Joel ended up in Bozeman. No, no, he put me there. He wants me there. He wants you here. He wants you in your context. And so we need to pay attention to that and ask, okay, God, if, if you have been very intentional in designing where I am, that means that my next door neighbor is my neighbor because you want it that way. And my boss is my boss because you want it that way. And the children down the street who my children play with, you put them there. It, it, none of it is by mistake. None of it is by accident. And so the question is, these are the people God has placed in my circle of influence. How can I work to promote the worship of Jesus in this circle it, with the people God has given me? How can I do that? Could be family members, co-workers, neighbors, people in your community. Um, none, none of us is going to go out and evangelize the entire world. We're just not going to. God has not asked us as individuals to go evangelize the entire world. You do not have that burden. You will not reach every nation in, in your life. I doubt. Uh, <laughs> you will not reach every nation in your lifetime. The church will do that collectively and over the ages, but you have been called to make much of the gospel right where you are. So I am encouraging you all to focus on relationships. What relationships has God handed to me that he intends for me to be intentional with? You need to look for opportunities with the people that God gives to you. Um, I could tell any number of stories, any number of stories of people who um, I didn't have to go looking for them, they're, they're neighbors, family members, co-workers, etc., um, both for me personally and people in our church. Um, in our church, we started with 19 adults, seven of them left in the first three months, and now we're about 120 on a Sunday after several years. And I, if I were to actually think about it and write it down, I bet you that more than 90% of the people who have come and joined our church have come because they have a personal connection to somebody in our church. Oh, they're a coworker. Oh, I work with Luke. Luke invited me. 
or, oh, I live next door to Spencer. Spencer invited me. And, and our, what we are trying to build into our people is to open their eyes to everyone around them. I had a couple in the church. I just, I just did their wedding, actually. I just married them. And I asked them, how do you see yourselves fitting into the church as far as contributing in ministry? And um, they said, well, we, we really would like to have a future in ministry where we are reaching um, um, the, 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 the more poor people in our neighborhood. And I said, great, how are you doing that right now? And they're, oh, yeah, I guess I should be doing that right now. They had this image in their head that someday, someday we will be in a position, you know, to minister to people who live in the, in the, in the poor part of our, of our town or whatever. And I'm encouraging them to say, you guys, open your eyes. There are needy people all around you, all around you. Who has God, or you don't, if God may take you to a new place to go reach another community or neighborhood someday. That's fine. But who is there right now? Who do you walk past every day to check your mail in the mailbox? Who do you sit next to on the bus? You know, these sorts of questions. Who's, who's the, the, the same young lady working at the cash register when I get my coffee every day? Who's that person? When, when, Lord, give me opportunities. He, he has. And unless you live alone in a, in a cabin in the woods totally alone and you never interact with any people, which that's actually true in some places in Montana, but not in our church, not in our church. We all have people who God has, God has orchestrated our lives so that there are people we regularly encounter and see, and, and we need to pay attention to them. God has given us opportunities. He's given us easy opportunities to build relationships with people and to be intentional with them. And, and so we, we often feel like the mission field is somewhere else. And, and it, it's, it's right here. It's next door. You know, it's in your backyard. It's, it's in your supermarket, these sorts of things. Um, I am c encouraging you to focus on relationship when you think about evangelism. We are relational creatures, correct? Why is that? Why are we relational? Because God, bless you, because God is relational. Where is the only perfect relationship? Where is it? The Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, same in their essence, distinct in their ministry, existing in perfect harmony and relationship for eternity past. Yes. God is relational within the Trinity. We are relational because we are made in God's image. Our world is not as relational as it used to be. I think this is largely due to advances in technology. Honestly, I can have a fake relationship with people I've never met um, um, through a series of ones and zeros that I, that I punch in on my phone or on, on my computer. And technology serves us too. I'm not saying technology is horrible, but I am saying it's becoming easier for us to be less relational, to be less relational. Um, you know, people with YouTube channels who have thousands, tens of thousands of followers, they'll never meet any of them in, in real life. They'll never have a face-to-face -face experience. They'll never, they'll never know the warmth of a, a touch on their shoulder, you know, from a real friend. I, um, it's, it's, it's horribly sad, in my opinion. But we are relational creatures, and as Christians, I, I believe it, it, as we live in an age that is becoming more and more distant, even in a huge city, I'm, I'm uh, up, up on the rooftop this morning with Abby and just, and just looking out the window. People, people are on their phones all the time. They're walking past other real life human beings, but they're not here. They're right here. And as Christians, we have the unique opportunity to bring people back into real relationship, to look them in the eye and give them a glass of water and and uh, let them sit on our, on our sofa and hear their story with our actual ears, not read it on a screen. We can reintroduce people to genuine relationship, and we should start with the people who are right in our lives already. Please be thinking about this. Relationships are hard. I'm the first to admit it. Um, 
This is funny. I don't know if you've seen this on Facebook, speaking of technology. It's, it's, it's a video of two dogs barking at each other through a fence. Have you seen this? And it says, it says this, this, is what, this is Facebook versus real life. And when it says Facebook, the gate is closed. And these two dogs are just, I mean, they're just nasty. They're barking at each other. They're showing their teeth. They want to rip each other apart. But then the gate slides back, and it says this is in real life. And they just, they look at each other and just, you know. Suddenly, they're not so tough, you know, because they're actually there face to face. Um, relationships, real person to person relationships are hard. They are. They take work. They're so good, but they take commitment, they take time, they take consistency. Um, and when we put ourselves out there, when we do start having gospel conversations with our neighbors, family members, whatever, they may walk away from that, that conversation saying, this guy is crazy. And here's the hard part. I've got to see them tomorrow still after they've rejected my message. I've still got to see that family member at the, uh, at the holiday get-together. And, ooh, last time we were together, I asked them what they thought about Jesus, and it didn't go so well. But they're still in my life. That's hard. It's hard. It's awkward. But I do believe it is what God intends for us to be persistent with the people he gives us. And here, here's what's nice. Um, we're friends with a, with a number of international students. I've mentioned this. Right now, and it, it comes and goes in different waves in terms of where they're from. We used to have a lot of Brazilian students who we hung out, but then Brazil, the Brazilian government discontinued that program, so the Brazilians went away. Then it was the Iranians, and right now it's the Indians. We're, we have a lot of Indian friends, and they, we welcome them into our home. They eat uh, food with us. They sit in our living room. We talk together. We laugh together, and we tell them the gospel. And they reject the gospel over and over again. But guess what? They will come back because we have proven to them that we love them and that they are our friends. You reject my gospel again today? Okay, same time next week? <laughs> and it's yes. Because whether people would admit it or not, we, we crave human-to-human -human relationship. We want that. And, and when you build a foundation of genuine relationship, genuine trust, we can have meaningful discussions about the gospel and come to totally different conclusions, but you don't doubt that I love you, and you know that I can. So guess what? I, am, I know that I'm going to have an audience with you again next week and again the week after that. Whereas we, we just, God saves people through the ministry of strangers, it's true, but they don't have that. They don't have that, and this is why I'm, I'm encouraging you, and maybe you do evangelism with strangers. That, that can be really good. Please, I'm saying that that can be really good. What I am encouraging you to do foundationally is to build relationship and build trust with people who are already in your life. Um, because I think what you will experience is that, is that God will bless that. You will have a, continue, a continued relationship. Let me tell you one story that's amazing. There was an international student from a South American country, and you'll have to forgive me, I don't remember which one, but it was a country that historically was not very friendly to Christianity. And an international student from this country came to study in the United States, this is a true story, and was befriended by Christians. And, the, and uh, had, a, had a wonderful experience with his time in America, largely because Christians befriended him. And uh, it's an interesting statistic. 80% of international students will never enter an American home. They will never be invited. It's very interesting. So when Christians open their homes and they say, please, we, we want to get to know you. We want to be your friends. We want to be helpful to you. This student never became a Christian. They, uh, he didn't. But he went back to his country, and he rose very high in, um, in the nation's government. Um, like he was a personal advisor, um, I believe, to the, to the president or prime minister, however their government was structured. And when a Christian missionary organization was trying to get into the country um, to begin church planting ever, efforts and to distribute Bibles, the government initially said no. But that international student stepped in and said, actually, prime minister, I know Christians and they're good people. I think we need to let them in. And they did. 
and now there are churches being planted and, and spreading all over that country. That, he never became a Christian himself, which is so interesting. But he said, I know these people, and these are good people. And so it's just, it's amazing what God does when we build genuine relationships with people. I believe the Lord blesses that, and he intends for us to be relational. And when we have that platform of trust, like I said, we can keep coming back, and we can keep giving people the gospel. And they see that, they see that we're not just out to tell you the gospel. Did you convert? Great. I got another one. Great. Okay, see ya. It's not that. It's they see that, wow, this person keeps bringing this up with me. They must really care. They, this is really important to them. Maybe I should listen a little more closely. Relationships provide a platform. They may reject your message dozens of times, but they will know that you care about them as people. They've been to your home. You've helped them when they were in need. There's, there's an Iranian woman, and out of respect for them, I always call a Persian woman. They prefer to be called Persian. Uh, an international student. She's from Isfahan, which if you don't know, that's one of the most strongly Muslim cities in Iran. Isfahan is a very religious city. She's very conservative. But we've befriended her, and she loves our family. She comes over and holds our baby and eats food with us, and uh, she knows we're Christians. And um, we, we, paid, um, I, we had a vehicle that we weren't driving anymore, and we gave it to her because she's a Ph.D. student, and she'll be in the U.S. for at least five years. She had no way to get around, and we just told her, we'd like for you to have this. And she didn't understand, and she, well, how much? How, how much would you like me to pay? No, no, you don't understand. This is a gift for you. We want you to have this. And she did not have a, have a category for that kind of kindness. And when she needs help now, or when she has questions about the area, or um, she needs a place to come and study or stay, who do you think she calls? She calls us. Because we have proven to her that we love her. We have proven it to her. And she may go back to Iran, still a Muslim, and she will go back knowing that we love her. And, and who knows who God may bring into her life later to be another minister of the gospel to her uh, to, so that her heart of stone will change to a, or be replaced with a heart of flesh. So, so if I could summarize, here's my bottom line. While standalone evangelistic efforts uh, and events, they can be helpful. They can be helpful. I am not speaking poorly of them. But I would encourage any local church to build a culture of evangelism through emphasis in relationship. Opening your eyes to who God has placed in your life already. Are there people out there who need Jesus? Yes, there are, but there are also people right here who you have the opportunity to build trust with and to build genuine friendship with for the sake of the gospel. I just encourage you, start there. Uh, e evangelizing a stranger is easy because you're never going to see them again. Evangelizing your neighbor or your mother is hard. Um, so, as we think about building cultures of evangelism in our churches, I, th I believe it starts with us as ministers doing that firsthand with the people God has placed closest to us. What do you all think about that? I, let's take a couple minutes and end this session by just, do you guys have any feedback about that, uh, that concept? What do you think? Does that make sense? Do you disagree? Yes. Agree? Yes. If you, well, one, if you can get an unbeliever to come to church, which again, that's not a magical solution, but you would be amazed. I mean, we, we're in church every Sunday, so we, we get used. We get used to really big, profound things. Hearing scripture read publicly and everybody saying amen is a big, profound thing. We get used to it because we hear it every Sunday, but it's a big deal. Hearing the gospel preached is a big deal. Singing, wow, you people really sing. That's, that's shocking to people who have, who, who have not been in a Christian church. So, so what I would say is don't underestimate the Sunday gathering. For, for starters, but two, if you meet an unbelieving person who is willing to actually read through something with you, if you're, you're looking for a specific resource, I can tell you one book that I that we, we love, and it's called The God Who Is There by, also by D.A. Carson, who also wrote, uh, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book by the same name, but D.A. Carson also wrote uh, The God Who Is There, and, and it's made for like small group studies, and um, we've had, we had um, our, the second convert in our church a 68-year-old woman from Switzerland who emigrated to the United States after her husband died. 
and um, th that that book was just God used that to be very impactful to her, and uh, and she came to faith, and she's she's a regular part of the church now. Esther Lutweiler, she's from the German uh, speaking part of Switzerland, and she's hilarious. Um, so that that's one book I recommend. I've known people who have been uh, um, whose hearts have been softened through reading C.S. Lewis's *Mere Christianity*. I think that's a good old standby. There, there are so many good books out there, but I, *The God Who Is There* by by Carson I have found personally to be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I think I've experienced that people articulate it differently. Like, like, so my friend from Iran, when he came, when he came into our coffee meeting and said, everything you say, I believe it. I woke up today and I believe it. And I was just basically like, uh, really? Yeah. All of it? Yeah. Even this part and this part? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, and, 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 uh, and then he just, he just jumped right into the life of the church, which I think is, I think is a huge part of this. Um, helping, I, I love it. I believe new converts, as again, kind of like baptism, as quickly and responsibly as possible, should jump into membership. I, I, I would, I, I would, I would um, want to make someone a member as quickly as I responsibly could. So, if someone is articulating, I ask, um, I often ask people the same questions I ask before I baptize them. Say, so, hey, so just so we're clear, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. You believe that he died on the cross paying for your sins and was raised again on the third day? Yes. And are you ready to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. So, so those are the questions I ask like in the moment before I baptize someone. And I also, when someone says, I, I think I'm a Christian now, I've often, I just ask them those same questions. Really? You, you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Yeah, I do. You believe he died on the cross for your sins and, and, and rose again on the third day? Yes. And you're ready to turn, you know, turn from your old self and follow him? Yes, I am. Well, brother, that's awesome. And uh, and and then and then we just, we start this we start this life of discipleship together, continued discipleship together. But ki kind of like with baptism, it, it's an exercise in faith and trust, because at the end of the day, we can't absolutely be sure where someone's heart is before the Lord. But we're asked to look for what what is the evidence. There's a confession there. I am confessing. Um, and I am, I am articulating to you that I'm ready to live a new life. And so, okay, there's some momentum there. Let's move with it. Um, so the sinner's prayer, eh, 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 I mean, it's not, it's not horrible. I do think um, if, some, if someone asks for help, like, I don't, I, hey, I don't even know how to pray. And I'd be, and I'd say, well, let's, let's talk about that together. So I'm not, um, I'm not totally against the sinner's prayer. But, I, but I, would, I wouldn't start there. I, I'd let them come to that conclusion. And uh, where if they're saying, yes, I believe this is who Jesus is. Yes, I believe this is what God has done to save sinners. Yes, I want to bow the knee to Jesus. Well, great. I said, well, I, I think you, if that's all true, so if, that, if that's all true, they have converted at that point, right? Um, if that's true, they've already converted. So then it's a matter of, okay, well, let's, I think it'd be a good idea if we went before the Lord, because you need to start building the habit of speaking to him anyway, and, and uh, why don't we start with you confessing these things to God? I think, that'd be, I think that'd be a great way to start your prayer life. Why don't we go to God right now together, you know, um, that sort of thing. So I would, so something like a sinner's prayer, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look to like as a formula, that sort of, I can just get them to say the prayer, and we all know that, we're not looking for that. At the same time, if someone is, if I believe, I believe this person is converted, hey, let's, let's go do business with God, you know? Uh, let's, res let's, again, we talked about doxology and, or theology leading to doxology. If you really believe this is all true about God, let's respond. Let's respond to him now together. Let's go to him in prayer. So I've never done the, like, repeat after me thing, you know? I've never done that. I've, um, I've noticed that new converts, they say very short, very simple prayers, and they're, and they're so beautiful. They're so beautiful. God, I, I believe you are God. God, I believe I am a sinner. God, thank you for saving me. I mean, they're just like short, simple prayers. I love it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I don't know if that answers your, your question or not, Brian. I just, and, and every person might articulate things a little bit differently. Yes. 
Absolutely. And, the, and, the, and the, the safe way to talk, talk less about them and more about God. God promises that those he saves, he saves to the uttermost. God promises uh, that he removes our sin. As far as the east is from the west, God promises that he, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I would just remind them of the promises of God. That, hey, God says that where there is repentance, uh, uh, that without faith it is impossible to please God. Seems like you have faith. That's awesome, brother. So I would, I would just keep pointing them back to God and, and in, in a way kind of let them reach those conclusions. Yeah, you don't want to be like, okay, you're in. Good job, you know. You know, yeah. Keep pushing them into the Bible. What does Scripture say? Oh, yeah. So, great, great thoughts, great questions. Does anybody else have any thoughts or questions about this, the importance of relationship? Yep. So, it, it's, ev it's evidence that uh, we need to work together as a body, right? I, I know exactly what you mean, and I'm glad you pointed that out. We have some people in our church where, where, where they are strongest when they are just br get, bringing people in through the door. They're making friends with people. They're bringing them into the community. But then someone might have a harder theological question, and this guy over here might answer it. He's not, he might be kind of awkward and, and nerdy, but he knows, how to, he knows how to articulate these things in a way that's understandable. And, and then this person over here is going to be good at follow-up. I mean, it's just the body, when, I, I'm so glad you brought this up. The body often works together, like for, we see like from five, seven, eight different angles for this one, for this one conversion. It's beautiful. Where, I mean, like, so like, I think about like we, we often host dinners at our house and we just invite international students. And I just think about the different people like we are helping by just opening our home. We're providing the place. We have some women in our church who cook the food. That's an important part. They're feeding them. And then we very strategically invite people like from our church to be there to sit among the international students who we know are comfortable around all different kinds of people and who are able to, to speak the gospel clearly. And it's, so it's kind of like, it's, like a, it's a team effort. And every single, every single person involved has a key part to play. So yeah, this is, this is, often, this is often a group effort. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that, that's excellent discussion, guys. I, I hope that you're seeing the value of the body in evangelism. Sometimes God does use just us to bring this person to faith. That does happen sometimes. Uh, but often, it's this way. It's, uh, they come into, and they come in and they experience the entire body of the church, and God uses multiple, like a team effort to make it happen. It's, it's awesome. Our God is big enough to handle all these things.